So I think it's fair to say none of us expected a fifth aspect in Marvel Champions, but with Deadpool, we got just that. We've got the pink pool aspect, and it's very interesting, very fun. I really like it. But some people are saying it's not really that strong, or it's kind of a meme aspect. It's not worth taking seriously. I disagree severely. I think it's a really good aspect. I think it's very fun. Like I said, it's tactical, and I think it's very much an aspect where it's not high risk, high reward. I have said that. A lot of people say that. But actually, I think it's about taking smart risks to get smart rewards. You have to kind of pick your moments. I kind of think of it like planning a heist, you know. It's a risk, but you're kind of trying to make it make sense, get the most out of it. You're not just going all in, all crazy, kind of like Star Lord. I don't think that works out most of the time. It obviously can, but your chances are pretty slim overall. The second thing I would say is I think it's very much an aspect where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The cards combo together and comboing them properly and in the right situations will get you a lot of value compared to just kind of, you know, playing those cards individually one at a time in a vacuum, not getting any kind of combos going. And yeah, you will suffer quite quickly if you do that. So it has a bit of a steeper learning curve than I think most people expected for what is generally a very fun, chaotic aspect, but it is very rewarding when you pull it off. And in that kind of regard, maybe it is high risk, high reward. So before we go really into any detail on the nerdy sort of analytical side, I want to talk to you guys about the theme just briefly, because not everyone kind of gets it at first. You take, say, a character like Thor, you give them the pool aspect, and you're basically playing Thor pool, which I think is pretty fun. This has big comic book kind of uh, precedent. I haven't read a lot of comics, but I have Googled them really, really well. So we've got Guardians, Asgardians, Avengers, X-Men. Nobody is safe. So any character in Marvel Champions that you can play, pretty much it makes sense for them to be some kind of Deadpool variant. So yeah, pretty fun. A lot of possibilities here. And they have leaned into this with the kind of second shadow of the past that comes with the pool aspect. If you are playing a hero in pool, you must include Crisis of Infinite Deadpools in the kind of encounter deck shuffled in. And if it comes up, it brings in, you know, kind of Dreadpool, who's another pool character, kind of your second nemesis and all that kind of stuff, just like Shadow of the Past. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the video, but it's good to keep that in mind. Now, I really like the pool aspect, but you can kind of think of it in two ways. There are kind of the careful cards that don't introduce anything negative. Then there are the risky cards, which introduce negative things, but you kind of combo off them and you get benefits for having put those negative things onto the board. Now, I think when you're deck building, you can even look at the kind of archetypes and where you build your decks as being more on the careful side or more on the risky side. And we are going to mainly frame this video around three archetypes, which I'm calling the safe pool archetype, the danger pool archetype, which is its opposite, you know, on each side of the uh, spectrum here. And then we have the Jedi pool aspect, and I'm not kidding, they gave us a lightsaber card, it's really good, that's probably my favourite archetype, we'll talk about that one last, but you could kind of put them on like a scale kind of like this, you know, with the safe kind of pool being that you're really careful, nothing risky, danger pool being very risky, but this would be inaccurate. So before we get into it, I kind of want you guys to not think of it as a spectrum at all, I actually think this is false, that's why there's a question mark in the old title on the screen here, I don't think that it's kind of a spectrum between, you know, it's safe to more dangerous. I actually think the safe stuff, the careful cards, kind of form the foundation of the aspect. And what you then build on top of it kind of defines your deck and what it does. So I would look at it like this. You've got the careful cards with no kind of risks associated. And then you can either build on more kind of riskless cards, which are generally going to be the basic cards. Or you can then go risky in different directions on top of it. So everything I talk about for the kind of safe pool for the first archetype here actually can help form a foundation for the riskier archetypes we'll look at later on. So if you are interested more in the risky ones and don't want to watch everything, I would still recommend trying to watch about the safe pool archetype. And that is where we're going to start. Before we go into that very, very last thing, I want to talk about the weaknesses because most of this video will cover what you can do with the pool aspect, but it's important to know what it kind of struggles with. Everything has to have weaknesses and this is what it has. So it cannot handle all the risks it introduces. I sort of alluded to this already. Smart risks are better than high risk. It has the worst threat removal of all the aspects, and that's not an exaggeration. It definitely has some threat removal, but you know, they only had a limited space in this pack. So I'm pretty sure the design philosophy here was let's make the pool aspect do pool things. Let's not worry about, you know, forwarding, you know, too much. Let's not go too much into things that the other aspects may be known for. We're going to go all in on the theme here, and that makes sense. So if you are playing in solo play, you might want to pick a hero that has good forwarding. So, I mean, it's kind of non-advice, you know, pick a strong solo hero if you want to play solo but that's kind of how it is for the pool aspect because you will not find a lot of threat removal here. The other way to do it, which we will go into a little bit, is basic allies can kind of cover for most of this. So if you're playing a low threat removal hero in the pool aspect, you're going to want a lot of basic allies to handle the falling. And the final weakness here that I think is quite prominent is it has its own shadow of the past, which is quite a big threat. I would say it's not always as big a threat as some shadow of the past sets can be, 
but it is still kind of equivalent. You're getting, you know, a minion in, you're getting a side scheme, and then you're shuffling some nasty cards into the encounter deck. That can be quite a problem for some archetypes, some kind of approaches for the pool aspect, but we'll get into that very soon. So the first archetype I want to talk about is safe pool, and the key cards here are the resources, mulligan, hitting factor, and tic-tac-toe. Now, you don't necessarily need all of these in every kind of build for safe pool, but I generally do. I think they're very, very good. We're going to talk all about those mainly, a lot of ways you can combo them together, and a few other associated cards that kind of form safe pool. And unlike the other archetypes, I'd actually say safe pool has some kind of notable variants, so we're going to actually go through a couple of different ways you can build this. Almost every hero can build in this pretty well. It really likes basic cards. And what the pool aspect does, and what we're going to see here, is that it's very good at amplifying your hero. So if your hero is very good at one thing, or has kind of a set game plan, the pool aspect can really help you achieve it. If your hero has a big weakness, it's maybe not going to help you fill that in. It's just going to make your hero more of your hero. And that is what I would say safe pool is best at. So first up, we have the resources, and these are really, really good. If you have taken less than five damage, they are going to be double resources. So if you put these in your deck along with strength, energy, and genius, you're basically running, you know, six double resources, which is very, very strong. You can spend these on anything. They're not kind of aspect blocked or anything like that. If you're at full health, they are triple resources, which is absurdly strong. And on turn one, guess what? You're pretty much always at full health. So if you get one of these in your opening hand, you can get a huge head start in the game. If you get to play like a big uh, upgrade or support with these, that can really set you up for the rest of the game. Now, the downside is if you are very injured, if you have taken more than five damage, then these things are going to be any worth one resource which is not great but at least it's still spendable and you know you can potentially draw one think okay i'm gonna flip down heal up and now guess what it's worth two resources again maybe i can play out an ally or something that's gonna help me while i'm alter ego you know you have options there so these are really really good if you're playing the pool aspect and these are not in your deck i think maybe you should be playing the pool aspect although certain characters maybe don't want a lot of resources but you know very very far few and far between very very niche builds these cards are good put them in your deck now, what you can do with these cards is stay healthy. These cards drive you to want to stay healthy to generate resources, and the pool aspect has two really, really good ways of healing. The first one is called Healing Factor, which basically makes you into Wolverine. At the start of every player phase, you're going to get two healing. Great, that's really, really good. Now, there are a lot of good free cost cards in the game. You know, I can say Heady Carry is one from the core set, and we can compare Heady Carry generating one resource to Healing Factor healing two damage. I think on an identity that healing is kind of worth one resource, I think that's kind of like their equal in value. Now, the advantage of like a Heady Carrier will be you can spend that kind of resource on anything, whereas Healing Factor, it's not a resource, it's just healing, even though it's maybe worth one resource. But the advantage of healing factor is twofold. Obviously, it's going to help keep your triple resources online in the pool aspect. But healing is a lot lower in supply than resources. Every turn, if you're drawing, let's say, five cards on an average hero, that's five resources. You're not able to just get five healing when you want it. So healing factor is really good in that respect. And I've tried running characters with really good defense that maybe I don't think would need healing factor without healing factor. And I have always regretted it, partially because of the triple resources, partially because of the uh, Shadow of the Past kind of uh, second set, the... Crisis of Infinite Deadpools that introduces something that Healing Factor is very good at countering. But yeah, in general, Healing Factor, super, super good card. You should probably have one of these in almost every pool deck. Maybe some exceptions, but very few and far between. Tic Tac Toe is one of my favorite cards in the entire aspect, maybe in the game. I just really love the flexibility of this card. This is one of the meta game cards. It's kind of, you know, breaking the fourth wall a bit. You're just playing kind of Tic Tac Toe, as we say over here, Noughts and Crosses, while you're playing Marvel Champions, but you're also kind of not. So, zero cost upgrade, slap it on the board. Spend one resource as a hero action. You get to move a damage from any character onto this card. Moving a damage off a character is effectively healing them. So again, helping you keep your triple resources online. And you can use this for allies or identities. It can be other players. You can even heal the villain if you are so inclined. I don't recommend that, but you could totally do that. And the best thing is you can keep charging this card up and it only triggers its extra effect, which is to then put the damage on tic-tac-toe onto an enemy if you get three in a row. Now, you could just go for three in a row. But it's much more efficient if you actually delay it. And you can get up to seven damage on this. So the way it works is the type of resource dictates where you have to put that damage you're moving onto it. So you're basically forming patterns on the sort of grid on this card. Now, the best way to do it, if you want maximum efficiency, if you want to use up the entire thing, is to basically put the damage in kind of an L shape at both opposite corners. And then wherever you put that seventh counter is going to end up basically being the, you know, he's going to get you three in a row somewhere. So then you can turn this into a seven damage burst option, which is really good. So seven potential healing, seven potential damage. Um, yes, it takes a few resources, but it's so flexible. I think this is really, really good. Now, on the other side of the pool aspect, the kind of more dangerous side, it does introduce a lot of negative icons and it does get benefits because of those. 
But if you're running the triple resources and you've got these negative icons on the board, a lot of them end up making you take more damage, which can make the triple resources, you know, double resources or the doubles single resources. You know, it will hit you, it will hurt you, and you'll get less value out of those resource cards. So that's something to keep in mind that there's a little bit of anti synergy between the triple resources and the riskier side of pool. But I would say the triple resources are so good, you still want to include them regardless of your pool build. Now, here is the kind of sort of nemesis minion, I'm calling it Dreadpool, that comes with the pool aspect. You're going to be seeing him if you play pool even a couple times. He will come up at some point, and he's very annoying. So he doesn't look that scary with two in each stat and three health, but whenever you defeat him, he comes back and his encounter card immediately. So you basically have to kind of commit to either he's going to be out the whole game dealing two damage every turn, or he's going to be coming back and you're going to have to deal three damage to him every turn, which is very, very annoying. Now, if you leave him up against you, Hitting Factor kind of counters him out if you have it up. So if you're hitting for two every turn and he's damaging for two every turn, it more or less equals out. It's not exact because the timing can be important. He can put you into lower health in the villain phase and then Kai can then defeat you before Hitting Factor triggers, so on and so forth. But that is one way to counter him. Obviously, if you go Alter Ego and he's scheming for two, that's a very big problem, especially in solo. So watch out for that. The other thing to note that is if you're in multiplayer, Dreadpool engages the first player. So if you're playing solo and you're four, you know, you might like it when a minion keeps re-engaging you to get cards. Or maybe you're Star-Lord and you like having that extra encounter card in front of you. So you, you keep taking him out to keep getting him as an extra encounter card to combo off of. But for the most part, he's a big pain for all heroes. And it's very hard to plan around that kind of combo in multiplayer when he's moving between the first player all the time. So yeah, beware of Dreadpool. The way to take him out permanently is to get the anti-regeneration rate in play, which is another encounter card that's part of the set. But obviously it can come up as a boost card, so you might never see it throughout the game. So if Dreadpool is out against you, you kind of just have to commit to him being there. Quite often that means me trying to go faster and win the game before he causes too much of an issue. But if you're lucky, you'll get the Anti-Generation Ray come up as an encounter card. We then get to do the hero action, which is spend all one of each resource and then attach it to your character. You get a nice plus one attack bonus, then you can attack Dreadpool. And what the Anti-Regeneration Ray does is it blanks out Dreadpool's text box, which means, yep, he's gone. You don't get the when defeated effect, so he just gets discarded when defeated like normal. So beware of Dreadpool. Now, going back to Tic-Tac-Toe, this card is really good for hitting allies. Hitting an ally is worth much more than hitting an identity, unless, of course, hitting an identity would stop them being defeated, you know. But generally, hitting an ally means you get an extra use from the ally. Most allies take one consequential damage when they activate. So if you move one damage off of them, you, you know, they can activate again. You can use them again. And not all allies are created equal, especially signature allies, which are very, very powerful. So if you're a hero with a really good signature ally, then Tic-Tac-Toe is going to give you a lot of value if you can get that on the board at the same time, which since Tic-Tac-Toe is just zero cost and kind of just sits there for a while, you can use it when you need it. It's not that hard to do. So very, very good combos here. We've also got combos we can do with the basic allies. Snow Guard is one of my favorites. It's a nice, juicy, expensive ally, which means the triple resource cards will get good value here. And since the all aspect has very low threat removal. Snow Guard being able to get free threat removal, a kind of, you know, a free forwarding stat, and then Tic-Tac-Toe keep her alive basically for the entire game, kind of solves all your threat problems. So I really, really enjoy that combo. Of course, if you have access to really powerful trait locked allies like Spider-Man, Peter Parker, or Gamora, then Tic-Tac-Toe keep getting more uses out of those, also going to be a very strong option. Now, we also can use its burst damage kind of tactically. Now, if there's a minion out with four or five health, absolutely would not hesitate to get three in a row on tic-tac-toe when you move damage from someone and then use that you know to take one of those out but you can also prolong it you know we talked about the l shapes in the corner get seven damage on tic-tac-toe and then drop it on a seven health or you know six health whatever or even an eight health minion to really help you deal with them and kind of just make them a non-issue i think that's really powerful kind of banking up a way to deal with any minion when you need it as you play through the game and you can also use this to take out villains. You can just drop a seven damage bomb on a villain. Now in solo play, that's very, very impactful. In multiplayer, not so much, but it's a nice little bonus. It definitely helps with the final push to defeat the villain. And since it's not an attack, it dodges effects like retaliate. So tic-tac-toe is just so flexible, kind of customize when you want to trigger it. And it has a lot of different uses between identity healing for the resources, allies, and you know defeating enemies. So super, super huge fan of this card. I think it's very easy to underrate it, but it should not be underestimated. After that, I kind of just want to talk about the pool resources again, because having triple resources is good, but you need somewhere to spend, you know, free resources to get maximum value out of them. So, well, some characters that like kind of cheaper cards might not want to really lean into this. A lot of decks, I think, will want a few free cost cards to make sure they have somewhere to go. You know, if you get an opening hand with a pool resource and a free cost support, I kind of said this before, it's super, super good. So, Paul, fortunately, has a lot of really good free cost cards as well, one of which is Mulligan here, which we're going to talk about more, but just make sure you've got plenty of good targets for these. You don't want to go overboard, but you definitely want maybe more free costs or even four cost cards than you would have ordinarily taken in a regular aspect deck. 
So Mulligan is one of my favorite cards in the entire aspect. I really, really like Mulligan. It's very, very fun. So a Mulligan in Marvel Champions normally means, you know, at the start of the game, your opening hand, you can kind of pick what cards you don't want and kind of get new ones to replace them. You're basically fishing for something that's going to be really good for turn one to help you with your opening. And Mulligan can be used just like that. So you cannot play this card if you played another card. This phase is very important. So it's really, you know, you look at your hand and if you want a new hand, that's when you play it. But it lets you dig for your deck. You get a whole new hand. So if you have a f six cards in hand, let's say you just started an Alter Ego, you know, you can then discard that whole hand and get six new cards. That's very powerful to search for important upgrades. If your character is someone like Ant-Man who has his helmet or Angel whose wings are super, super powerful, you can use Mulligan to dig, you know, five or six cards deeper into your deck and hopefully find really good cards to set you up for the rest of the game. And it's also good for finding those triple resources at the start of the game too. So a mulligan in your opening hand is a very powerful option. You won't always want to do it. You know, if you've got really good opening options already, some really good uh, cards, just play those, no problem. And that is one of the ways this kind of aspect amplifies its hero, both with, you know, those resources paying for lots of your cards quickly, but also finding your key cards quickly. Fortunately, a lot of key upgrades and support cards are free cost. So, you know, Mulligan and the triple resources all work super well together. And I've got to point out the art. He's drawing a new hand. That is what the card does. Perfect. The other use for this card, I think, is if you have a bad hand, you know, you could be in the middle of the game and you just don't like your options, but Mulligan is in your hand. Okay, I'll play Mulligan, reset my entire hand, and hopefully draw something better. If you have a bad hand, but your deck is well made, the chances of getting a second bad hand in a row should be slim to none, should be very, very rare. So generally, if you don't like your hand and you mulligan, you're almost always going to get something better. I think this is, you know, I don't know if this has ever backfired for me. It's very strong. So really keep that in mind. Don't be afraid to mulligan if you're not that keen on your options in your hand. Or if your hand's very average, but you think your deck's very good, you know, just look for something better and you'll probably find it. And the other advantage of moving for your deck quicker like this is you're going to keep coming across those triple resources faster. The faster you burn for your deck and reset it, the quicker those good cards will come back to you, which is a big advantage. Now you will get another encounter card quicker. We'll talk about that a bit more in a second, but I don't think that's as bad as you would think. So yes, getting an extra encounter card is bad, but unless you go for your deck an entire extra time in that game, you'll still get the same amount of encounter cards total throughout the whole span of the game. Getting them earlier is worse because you're less well set up, but Mulligan is kind of setting you up better quicker in the first place. But I think the benefits tremendously outweigh the negatives. However, there is one case where I would be very, very cautious about using Mulligan. And that is if you're already in a bad situation. If you have like multiple minions out against you, maybe a nasty side scheme, and you're sweating, you don't know how you're going to handle this problem. You're under pressure and you've only got a few cards left in your deck. If using Mulligan will cause you to get an encounter card one turn earlier than otherwise, and you're in trouble, don't do it because you're going to need to try and stabilize. You know, you don't want to make the problem worse. I don't think if you're in a bad situation, unless you have a really key card that you know is left in your deck, Mulligan is really going to help you out of that hole. You probably just want to slow things down and try and take care of that problem. So in that situation, I would be a little bit careful. Now, the other thing I want to talk about with Mulligan is a phenomenon that I have coined Mulligan. I don't know if it really has a term, but I absolutely love this. It's why it really elevates this card just from great to me to like incredibly amazing. So we've got the wording here that we've already discussed. You cannot play this card if you played another card this phase. That would seem that it means Mulligan must be the first thing you do with the cards in your hand that turn, right? Well, you can still spend cards from your hand or discard cards from your hand, and you haven't played a card still. You just discarded or spent it. You, so cards like Tic-Tac-Toe, which let you spend a resource of any type, you can spend a card in hand as a resource on Tic-Tac-Toe, still not play the card, then you can Mulligan. So if I have five cards and Tic-Tac-Toe is on the board, I can spend one of those cards on Tic-Tac-Toe, the other three on Mulligan, and I've got five cards in hand again, but I have used Tic-Tac-Toe to heal someone and I've got that damage stored on Tic-Tac-Toe ready for later. And with triple resources or extra cards in hand, I think you can get a lot more cards spent and you know discarded for various effects and then still Mulligan and draw back up to your hand size, which is very, very powerful. Now there are other cards in the pool aspect that allow this, cards that let you spend resources that don't make you play cards from your hand. We've got Stick to Itiveness, which is an incredibly powerful card. We'll be coming back to this one a lot. It's a two cost upgrade. Hero action, spend a physical resource and exhaust it to ready your hero. If your hero has good stats, this card is, it's hard not to take. If your hero just takes kind of average stats, you know, you're a bit low on threat removal and you've got that two falling stat, you know, it might still be worth it just for the supply and demand problem Paul has with getting threat removal. Stick to Itiveness, very, very powerful. Blackout is kind of the threat removal equivalent of tic-tac-toe. It's not as customizable. You have to fill all the slots with the right resource type, removing threat, blah, 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 to get it to trigger its final effect, which is just a confuse effect. 
So the amount of threat removal you do doesn't affect the final effect. You do have to fully charge it and it is just going to be a confuse. I don't think this is as good as tic-tac-toe, but because of that supply and demand problem with threat removal, maybe it is. It is pretty useful on a lot of characters. So I do like it. And we don't really have access to a lot of status cards in the pool aspect. So again, that confuse can be very handy if you're playing a hero that likes to go or trigger a lot in the pool aspect. Final card here is Plot Convenience, which is very, very fun. I really like this card. It is a bit slow, especially for solo play. It's a two cost support. You put it on the board, then you exhaust it and you have one of two options. Attach an aspect card or draw an aspect card from it to your hand. So you can kind of use this card to bank cards for later. So if you're at low health and have a, say, a triple resource, you, know, you can put it under this card. And then when you're at high health later, get it back and get extra value. That's one of my favorite uses. But in multiplayer, you know, any player can trigger this. So different players at the table can swap different aspect cards all around. So you, know, you could end up playing a protection card from your protection player. They could end up playing a leadership card from your leadership player. Or, you know, you could hand out one of your pool cards to somebody else for some crazy shenanigans. So that's really fun. The downside is, like I said, it's slow. You're paying, you know, you if you have five cards in hand and you choose to play Plot Convenience, you don't need to spend two resources on it to get it down. You don't need to attach a card to be able to get some value from it later. So, you know, you basically used up four resources that turn and kind of haven't achieved anything immediate. And all you're going to get next turn, you know, next time you use it really, is potentially getting one card back that you put in. So it has to be used tactically to get full value. But used well, it can be really, really good. We've already talked about how you can put the triple resources under it, but there are other cards which we'll talk about later that really have key timing that when used at the right time, really elevate their value. So this card is really good for setting those things up. It's also really good in multiplayer, as I said. My favorite card for this is Sunfire. Because Sunfire is an ally that when you play from your hand and spend an energy, he removes an attachment from a villain. It's really powerful to have him available because sometimes you have a nasty attachment on the villain. Sunfire is nowhere to be found. You cannot even make the call for Sunfire because he must be played from your hand to get that effect. But with Plot Convenience, as soon as a nasty attachment turns up, you just exhaust Plot Convenience, grab Sunfire back, and then you play him. That is so, so good. So really huge fan of this card in multiplayer. I like it in solo, but I don't think it's that powerful most of the time. But it is very fun. And now we come to what I'm calling the first variant of Safe Pool. The other archetypes, like I say, I think they just kind of have one major kind of style. But with the Safe Pool, I think it's quite broad that you can approach it in different ways. And the first one is small pool, which is basically, it's got the same key cards as normal safe pool, but really it might only take those cards or one or two extra. It's really trying to take a very minimal amount of pool cards and just kind of use the best ones from pool to take advantage of all the good basic cards they like. And because it's taking a higher than average amount of basic cards, it really likes powerful basic cards that are locked to certain traits. So we've already looked at Gamora, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, those kind of cards. Anyone with ingenuity access, that kind of thing also fits in really well. And before we go into a deck example, I want to talk about one more card, which is Get Ragey. I really like this card. It readies an ally. It, then that ally gets plus one attack to the end of the phase. It's basically a version of Get Ready from the core set that is slightly better. Hugely good in the pool aspect because as we'll come to, the pool allies do not take consequential damage. But even with the basic allies, we have allies like Nick Fury and Professor X who leave the game pretty quickly. They leave the game at the end of the round and they have free hit points. And it's very hard to get multiple uses out of them in the pool aspect in one round unless you have a way to ready them up. So Get Ragey basically gives Nick Fury or Professor X one extra use, which is very, very powerful. Three extra damage, three extra forwarding, you know, or even two threat removal from Nick is still good. If you don't use a plus one attack, this card is still good. But, you know, plus one attack on Professor X, maybe not so good, but very, very funny. So really like this card. Don't let these guys get away without using up all their health properly. And we can even look at this in multiplayer. You can use Get Ragey and Tic-Tac-Toe on other players' allies, which is very, very good. You know, if you can ready up a really powerful kind of uh, Yondu or someone built up from a leadership, that's really strong. Certain allies, you know, in a pinch, they kind of give you burst value. That's what readying them up does. With, so that is very useful. Tic-Tac-Toe can help keep other people's powerful signature allies and things alive, which is one of the ways in multiplayer that Tic-Tac-Toe gets even better. Cannot say enough about this card. It's very, very good. Then you can kind of look from the leadership side. They can ready up your allies without consequential damage or allies like Nick Fury and Professor X get that extra value. And if your poor allies stick around for a long time because they don't have consequential damage, then putting upgrades like Inspired on them can be very, very powerful as well. So the first example I have here is actually Rocket. I don't think people will think Rocket a very natural fit for the pool aspect, but that's kind of why I wanted him to be the first example. Anyone can really do this. He's got really good ally access with characters like Gamora and Groot that most characters cannot run. He's also got Moon Girl and Ingenuity. And he likes to draw through his deck because he's quite reliant on his weapons, and which is where cards like Mulligan can be really powerful to get those ready. Now, this deck is kind of a basic deck. It is basic in terms of using a lot of basic cards, but the strategy I kind of 
spent around deck building it is kind of compartmentalizing what it does. And I think this is kind of a fun topic in general, but it also works quite well with the sort of small pool and safe pool kind of archetypes here, where I can kind of sort of look at the main pillars of the game. You need to do damage, you need to remove threat, you need to stay alive. And I can kind of assign kind of roles to his different cards of how I'm going to achieve that. Most of the damage will come from his weapons and allies. Most of the fording will come from his basic fort and his allies. And then his survival will come from healing factor and blocking with allies. Allies kind of do a bit of everything. And obviously this kind of build with eight basic allies is going to do a bit more than average. They're quite expensive, some of these. That's where a lot of his resources are coming in. Of course, he's got really strong economy from pool on all those resource generators. So he's kind of very well-rounded. Everything in the deck kind of has its place and purpose, and you kind of know where you're at. And if you need more fording, you kind of know what to prioritize. If you need more damage, you know, you're going to kind of prioritize his weapons even more than you are already. And he's got blackout here as well, even though, you know, it's a small port, trying to include as little as possible. But that threat removal and the confuse really helps him go ultra ego to use his tinkering ability and more, which he really likes. And of course, Moon Girl, as we sort of mentioned. So really, really good. Next up, we have what I'm calling the Mulligan variant. So we talked about Mulligan before, which is kind of the phenomenon of Although you cannot play cards before you play mulligan, you can spend them. And then you can mulligan and kind of reclaim the full hand size as if you had never spent them in the first place, which is very strong. Now, there are other cards which can benefit from this, which we're going to look at. It really likes heroes that are driven to play mulligan a lot. You're going to be taking free copies of mulligan in these decks. And, you know, heroes with a lot of upgrades they want to set up quickly or some really, really powerful events that kind of eclipse everything else. Heroes that want to move through their deck fast really like leaning into mulligan. And if you're leaning into mulligan, you might as well get full mulligan. And there are plenty of heroes which can kind of bring their own ways to discard cards or spend cards without playing a card, which is very strong for this as well and kind of gets you started on the concept earlier. So first of all, I want to talk about the basic cards which work with Mulligan or Mulligan. So you've got characters like Machine Man, he's probably the best one, where you can spend a resource on them and, you know, get some kind of benefit, send you Mulligan to redraw your whole hand. Machine Man is particularly good because you can spend a varying amount of resources on him and it's not locked to hero form, which means if you're Alter Ego, you can still get Mulligan with that bigger hand size while, you know, directly using the options to spend resources like this. So I think that's very, very strong. So I've got Heroes. Captain America is probably my favorite here. He starts with this ability, I can do this all day. It's an action on his hero card. He can discard one card from his hand and ready up. So you use Captain America, then you discard a card to ready him up, then you play Mulligan and you have five cards again. That kind of thing I think is very strong. Now, I've alluded to the Alter Ego hand size a couple of times here, but there are some characters with a much bigger hand size than Alter Ego that increases by two or so than their hero form. So if you start in hero form and don't really like your options, but your deck has lots of good cards to play in Alter Ego, you can then flip to Alter Ego, play Mulligan, and draw multiple extra cards. And that can be very, very strong. So the example I've gone with here is Captain Marvel, because she likes to get Alter Ego. And although the hand size isn't that much bigger in Alter Ego, it still helps. And that is why a lot of her cards here are all playable from Alter Ego. I've not really added anything into the deck that you cannot play from Alter Ego, just to try and make that consistent. So she has five triple resources, the pool ones if she's at full health, and she does have a way to heal on her hero card, which makes them even more consistent. And also her two copies of energy absorption, which are very, very powerful. So you're going to quite often get turns with mulligan and a triple resource. So you can spend up to three cards from your hand and then still get the mulligan going. And you're probably going to draw into five cards again, which might include another triple resource. So you move through your deck very fast, get lots and lots of resources, get lots and lots of mulligan, and it's very strong. She just has natural energy sinks with energy channel, and it's generally a very strong all-round hero. So as we said about Paul, it's very good at amplifying your hero. Captain Marvel is very good solo already. So this is going to be a great build in solo or multiplayer, although it will be a little bit more damage focused. The allies do make it very, very flexible. Again, Tic-Tac-Toe, Snow Guard. She can super easily afford all these characters. Hope Summers is a nice addition. She can grab superpowers, which means she can grab energy channel, which gives you another resource sink if you really want to go crazy on Mulligan. So yeah, I really like this build. Very good for Captain Marvel. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Next up, we have the RPS variant, which simply stands for Rock, Paper, Scissors, which is a card we haven't talked about yet. And this is a really fun card. I absolutely love this card. It's another one of the meta games. It is probably the most interesting one, although I think I do prefer Tic-Tac-Toe. This one is really making you play Rock, Paper, Scissors, but with the resource types, and that is awesome. So what you have to do is choose a card in your hand, then discard a card from your deck. And if the resource types are in your favor, then you get to draw that card you discarded. And the way this works is that it looks at the card you chose in your hand, and then it looks at the diagram on the card. So if I choose a mental resource in my hand and I discard from my deck, I'm hoping for a physical resource because the mental resource on this chart points to the uh, the physical resource. You could kind of think as of the mental resource maybe as being something like scissors and physical being as paper in typical rock, paper, scissors. So if you pick scissors, you're hoping to discard paper. Hopefully that makes sense. There's a wild icon in the middle 
And what this means is that if you choose a wild resource in your hand, it will be any of the normal resources. The only thing it won't be is another wild icon. So if you pick a wild in your hand and discard a wild, that's quite unfortunate. But thankfully, that is very, very rare for all but one character, that being Domino. But she can swap the cards on top of her deck, so she can use this quite well as well. Now, the way you get most use out of this is to have a majority of one resource, and that is very powerful. Hulk is probably the best example. He has tons and tons of physicals. You just need to sprinkle in a few mentals to be able to have options to actually choose for rock, paper, scissors, a wild or two if you can get it, and he'll have very, very good consistency. It basically turns rock, paper, scissors into a discount Avengers Mansion just for yourself. You'll get one card from it most turns, although it is a hero action which makes it slightly more restrictive, and it does have a chance to miss, even with the best of kind of odds and deck builds. So it isn't entirely reliable, but for one cost for quite a consistent source of card draw, if you build into it, that is very good. The other option you can do is just put in a lot of wild resources. Don't worry about the rest. And whenever a wild resource is in your hand, just go for rock, paper, scissors, and you're probably going to draw a card. I really, really like that. Characters like Black Panther and Spectrum have a lot of wilds floating around, which makes this an excellent choice for them. And the third option is, of course, to combine them. I sort of already talked about this with option one, but if you're playing a character like Hulk with lots of one type of resource and then a couple of the kind of countering resource, you can also sprinkle in a couple of wilds and that will really up your chances as well in combination. So I think that's very fun. And we'll come back to this in a second. There are a couple of other pool cards I want to talk about under the safe pool kind of umbrella. And this is the final kind of uh, sub variant of this archetype. So we're just going to go through those now. We have break time, which is a very fun alliance card. It's free cost per person. This is an alter ego action that says, take a break. It says, go away from the game and just, you know, see you later having a break now. And that is super fun from a meta level. My one criticism here is that if I'm low health and I really need healing, the game is probably in a very tense position and I don't know if I want to step away from the table. So what I would say is if you are really enjoying your game of Marvel Champions and don't just want to disappear for half an hour because it heals you technically per minute you're away from the table, just, you know, hand wave it, you know, just say, okay, we're all at full health now. You know, there's no shame in that. I think, you know, if you're a multiplayer, you might need to discuss it with people, but in solo play, no one's going to police you. Nobody cares. Just use this card as a full heal. That is effectively mechanically what this card is. You pay for it and you're at full health. Really, really good. So characters like She-Hulk, I think are really good with this, especially if you have health boost on top of that, that can be crazy valuable. You've also got characters like Captain Marvel, who maybe like to boost their health. Endurance is a nice energy card. She likes energy cards. She can even hand them out in multiplayer and then use break time because she can pay for it very easily. So that's another combo you can kind of go with there. Nine health characters don't like it. So this is a card that is very situational. It likes having characters with high health, likes having characters that can go alter ego. Ideally, this is best used in multiplayer with multiple high health characters. Now, the remaining safe pool cards I've got here are Cut Upper, Get Good, Not My Responsibility, and Get In Front Of Me. Cut Upper is a very solid card. It deals five damage for free cost and stuns the enemy. It's very reminiscent of Tackle from Protection or even Concussive Blow from uh, Justice. Just, you know, it's a stun or even drop kick a little bit. I think drop kick is better if you build into all the resources, but nonetheless, cut upper is very solid. It's a nice way to get some damage on the villain, sort of push towards that victory condition of defeating them while slowing down their damage against you. Get good is a really fun card, a very meta card. We're gonna ignore the top text for now. It's a two cost upgrade. It's a force interrupt that when a player would be defeated, they set their hit point dial to one, go to ultra ego, and then this card is removed from the game. And this is really fun because this is a kind of a card that helps you save someone that works in multiplayer. This can affect anyone at the table. It is a forced interrupt, so you can't pick and choose, but you know, if someone's being defeated, you are probably gonna want to save them. I think that's really fun. And you can use this in any kind of pool deck. You can use it in a risky one to kind of save someone if your shenanigans kind of put someone else in danger, but it's just good in general in, you know, a safe pool deck because some villains, you know, especially if we go for the very hard ones like Ronan, can just blow people away out of nowhere with massive overkill, extra boost card attacks. So having kind of an insurance policy on the board in multiplayer is very strong. In solo play, this is such a big chunk of your resources turn to turn. You know, a two cost card is free effective resources. That's kind of how we say it. You know, if you have five cards in your hand, I choose to play get good. I spend the resources from hand. I've actually lost three cards from my hand. Every card is a potential resource, so on and so forth. So for free effective resources, this is quite a lot. I would rather in a solo game, use that much of my hand, you know, equivalent of, of resources to try and not get into a position where I need get good in the first place. But it has one extra thing going for it. it. Has that top text that we ignored before. Reduce the cost to play get good if you did not win your previous game of Marvel Champions, which is insane. Very meta, I love it, but also very strong. If this card is zero cost, it has a very strong case to be included in every single pool deck ever. It's such a strong effect for that. And, you know, even getting that kind of free flipped Ultra Ego also has its own uses. You know, people said we'll never get an aspect card that lets people go Ultra Ego, but here we are, it kind of does. So there's some kind of cool tactical stuff there. And yeah, for zero cost, kind of being this easy insurance policy, 
very, very good card. Now, again, a bit like with break time, if you don't like that meta aspect, taking previous games into account, if you know what I mean, no one's going to police you in solo play if you just say this is zero cost all the time. If you're really serious about doing the best you can with Paul, there's no point going to say, oh, I want to take on this really hard villain with Paul. Now I need to go and, you know, just lose to some random villain to power up, get good, you know, and then I can then I can try this tough villain. You might as well just say it's zero cost, guys, and just pretend you lost the last game. No one's going to police you, you know, do what you like. Whether if you want to do it in kind of the original spirit of the card, you want to go a bit more, you know, serious, try hard. Whatever works for you is honestly, you know, no one's going to care. Multiplayer, definitely discuss that first, but... Yeah, this is a really fun one. If you're going to like a multiplayer event and you're bringing a pool deck, just bring this card in your back pocket. So if you guys lose, you can then bring it out into your deck for the next attempt. Now, Not Remind Responsibility is a fun card. It's kind of a parody of Great Responsibility. I think this card is slightly overrated in general because it still suffers from one of the major problems of Great Responsibility, which is the timing. If the villain is not scheming when this card is in your hand, it's generally hard to get value from it. In multiplayer, a little bit easier, um, but still, it is a little bit tricky because what you have to do is make you or your ally take the damage from that scheme uh, anyway. So the threat added on basically becomes damage. So it's costing you one card and then basically either you're taking a bunch of damage or your ally is getting defeated. And an ally being defeated is one less block against an attack. So this is very, very good if you need help against incoming threat. But you have to watch for the timing and it is going to cost you, you know, an ally that can block is effectively a tough card in most circumstances, kind of equivalent. It will just block an entire attack for you. So that is quite a steep price to pay, a bit more than the average Confuse, although I do think Confuses in general in the game are maybe slightly underpriced. So this is a good card, but it is not a card I am going out of my way to run if I'm low on deck space, things like that. And definitely not very often in solo play, unless my character really wants to go Ultra Ego a lot, in which case I might you know, be risking being Ultra Ego a lot, which will make this card a lot more consistent to use. Get in front of me is a very interesting, it's a parody of get behind me from the core set. It does suffer from some of the same weaknesses again. If a treachery card doesn't come up to cancel, then this is just a dead card in your hand. It's just a blank card with one resource you can spend. But if Shadow of the Past comes up, it's super useful. Now the problem with get behind me was not only did it have to have the right timing, you need a treachery card to come up that's you know worse than converting it into an attack against you, which is what this does. You also needed to be able to pay for it. You're basically paying two effective resources for the privilege of turning something into an attack against you. And attacks against you aren't that good in the first place. This card is better because if the attack is defended by an ally or another hero, then you get to draw a card. And drawing a card is kind of refunding half the cost, making this very much a one effective resource card in most cases, which is good. And I do like this in multiplayer. I think in four player, this is particularly good, especially because Crisis of Infinite Deadpools, the kind of uh, second shot of the past that Paul has to have can be cancelled with this as well, but it is locked to hero form. So if you're an ultra ego, when that comes up, still a problem. So again, I don't go out of my way to run this card, but if you're in multiplayer, definitely strongly consider it very, very good when it works out in your favor. Now, all the way back to what we were originally talking about here, the rock, paper, scissors variant, we have Hulk. I did mention this build. It's just very, very fun. We've got 25 physical resources in this deck, 10 mental resources. This gives us really good odds when we're discarding uh, from our deck and chosen a mental card in hand to get a physical resource and draw it. It also has one wild in Deadpool kind of circulating. And when I say circulating, it's not an upgrade. It's not a permanent upgrade or support that will sit on the board forever. So whenever you're going for your deck, you have a chance of having Deadpool in hand. And whenever he comes into your hand, you can use him. If he was an upgrade or support that just stuck around forever, no matter what, you know, unless an encounter card discards him. Um, he would not be as accessible for rock, paper, scissors to choose. So Deadpool is a very good addition here. And we do have a couple of energy resources in this deck that we've added in. We've got Deft Focus, Healing Factor, Stick to Itiveness, all very good cards for Paul Hulk. But the nice thing about these is that they are upgrades and supports. So they are not in circulation. You know, once they're on the board, you're not going to have to worry about them being in your deck and going around. So that's pretty nice. And there's still very few of them. So again, not a big deal anyway. So this is a really fun little build for Hulk. Now, the basic allies do help him fort a lot, so it isn't terrible solo, but again, with Hulk, if you play him in multiplayer, you'll have a much better time. Next up, we're going to talk about Danger Pool, which I'm really excited for. This is the very fun, the exciting, the, this is what Pool, I think, is known for. This is what people kind of envision when they go to play Pool. And the key cards are I Got This, which we'll talk about in quite some detail, and the Pool Allies, which I've already referenced a little bit, and a very special card called Live Dangerously, which I adore but it is very dangerous. So you have to be very careful with that. Now, we sort of alluded to Paul introducing risks in the form of negative icons and Danger Paul really likes heroes and sort of methods to mitigate those negative icons. If you have some way to bypass crisis icons, then, you know, and still remove threat, then you're going to be in a good place in Danger Paul. If you can kind of 
handle the fence with maybe like status cards or something and not worry about amplifier icons making the villain hit you harder, then you're also in a very good spot. But I will say this is the riskiest archetype in all of Paul. So luck is going to play a factor. You're going to have very different experiences depending on how the game goes. And I will say subsequently, and maybe slightly sadly, that does, I would say, make it the weakest uh, archetype in the Paul aspect. But it can still be good, especially with the right hero. This one is very hero dependent. And we will have some different hero options for you suggested toward the end of this. So with the allies, you'll probably see all of them have a negative icon. All of them also have no consequential damage. All of them also have a physical resource, which is very good for things like stick to or any characters like physical resources for other reasons. Now, there is kind of a catch-22 situation here because no consequential damage means your allies can potentially live for the whole game. You just keep using them again and again. They don't take damage. They're just going to stick around. But that means you have to stuff the negative icons for the whole game, which can be very tricky. So it's kind of a fine balancing act, quite a fun one, I would say, but it's something to be aware of. In solo play, I'd be very wary of playing more than one ally with an acceleration icon because the threat thresholds in solo can be quite punishing. And it's not just one extra threat per turn you have to deal with, which Paul isn't very good of dealing with, but also you're one kind of closer to going over that threshold in case an advance, you know, or something else that makes a villain scheme comes up. So that can lead to game losses. So be aware of how much threat can go in the main scheme. Be a little bit cautious in solo play about playing acceleration icons. In multiplayer, you can be very free with it. If we look at head pool, here's an amplify icon. It's kind of the opposite case. In solo play, in, you know, I don't know, 70, 80% of turns, if not more, this is mostly going to be plus one damage on the villain's attack, and that will be it. So if you're blocking with allies or status cards or have really good defense anyway, this isn't a big deal. So you can kind of make use of that. That's fine. But in multiplayer, you're each getting attacked. The villain every round is going to be attacking each of you at least once or, you know, scheming can be activating and then with a lot more encounter cards could be activating even more so amplifier gets a lot worse in multiplayer and you should be cautious with it acceleration tokens much worse in solo play and you should be cautious with them but otherwise they're very very good at what they do bob is fun two cost two health he deals two damage or one threat removal when he comes in the two damage is more valuable and he can just be used kind of like a normal two cost ally to do whatever you need with if you keep falling for one the acceleration icon keeps being one extra threat back on it kind of balances out and then whenever you're ready to block with him you just block with him Fine, no big deal. Dog Paul is very much the defensive ally in Paul aspect, free cost. I would say in standard play, he's a lot better because he's often going to be able to block one extra attack compared to in uh, expert mode, but it does vary. It will depend on the villain's attack and how lucky you get with the boost cards and so on. So, you know, amplify icons could also impact that. But effectively, he comes into play, you attack with him because he's got no consequential damage, that attack does not cause him to lose his toughness. Then you defend, and then you defend. And between the retaliate and the when defeated effect and that initial attack that doesn't pop the tough, he will get about three to four damage out. So I quite like Dog Pool. Kid Pool is a bit more niche. He's really good if the piercing is good. And a lot of modern villains do have a lot of tough going on. And, you know, even Thanos, even, you know, even Claw, I think, has a good bit of tough. So Kid Pool does have some good uses, but I do think he's the least interesting of the allies here. Still, two damage every turn with piercing is pretty nice to have available. So he is still perfectly good and usable. I do like Kid Pool. I do play him a fair bit still along with all these other allies on the screen here. Head Paul is really interesting. He's definitely the most interesting of the poor allies, in my opinion, because not only does he have that two fort, which is why you actually saw him in that Hulk deck I uh, previously looked at, because Hulk doesn't mind that much about Amplifies. He's very tanky. Hulk can take the damage. He doesn't have threat removal. So Head Paul can bring that two threat removal every single turn, which can be worth the Amplify icon on its own sometimes. Now, with one attack, he might not seem that good, but he has this really fun response that after he attacks and damages a minion, that minion can attack another character, another enemy of your choice. That is very, very fun. So head pull is really, really enjoyable to use. Um, you know, what a what a crazy concept. I'm sure there's a really good explanation for it in the comics, maybe. But yeah, so I really like all these allies. I do think they're a little bit situational. I do think you don't want too many out at one time, but you do also want to get them out to start comboing off the icons. And that brings me into my first major point kind of against them in a way. If you're not comboing off their icons, you probably shouldn't be using them because the basic allies are so, so strong. If we're talking from sort of a competitive, you know, really serious deck building, you know, make this deck really strong kind of viewpoint, then yeah, the pool allies will struggle to keep up with the basic allies in a vacuum. Now, if for fun or for theme, anything you want, absolutely use the pool allies. They are perfectly usable, but from a competitive, you know, serious standpoint, maybe not quite as much unless you're comboing off them. Then we've got the expensive pool allies, and these are really fun, but two of them are quite flawed. So I really like Lady Deadpool. I think this is a really fun card. She has a when defeated effect that says defeat a non-elite minion. That's really strong. So you can kind of block the villain's attack, and if there's a minion out, just you know wipe it off the board. Very, very useful. She also has very balanced stats, so she can do whatever you need. 
but it does come with that amplify icon. And here's the catch 22 here. It's more common to have a minion out in multiplayer, but amplify icons punish you more in multiplayer. I think the sweet spot for her is really maybe two player or, you know, maybe three player if you have some really good kind of defensive options on your team. But nonetheless, I do like Lady Deadpool. I will include her in a lot of decks. Quite often I'll have two of the amplify icon uh, allies that you just saw and Lady Deadpool and Headpool as two amplify ones. And I'll have one of each out to get both icons on the board to benefit from those with some of the cards we'll look at later on. It's kind of a more balanced approach, but I do really like her. I think she's really fun. The timing is maybe harder than you'd expect to get a minion out and have her then be defeated at the right time. I have had her attacked by two attack villains that then put a zero boost card, which meant she hasn't been defeated because she has a full health, you know, not taking consequential damage, which means I cannot use her to defeat a minion that I was counting on her to defeat. So in standard play, especially, I'd say she's a little bit weaker or those two attack, one attack villains on expert, um, but generally very, very good. Any difficulty. So keep that in mind. And then we have Panda Paul and Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Both of these are really fun. You know, I really love Panda Paul in terms of theme. Hazard icons are just so bad, guys. Like, really, really bad. Now, against easier villains, and again, on standard mode, they're not quite as bad. But if you're pushing some of the harder villains on Expert, introducing uh, extra hazard icons onto the board, especially for long periods of play, and you do need a few turns for these cards to really pay off. I mean, they don't really pay off. I think you're taking a more negative from the hazard icons than they ever really produce. And not just in a vacuum, but I would even argue in combination with most of the other pool cards we're going to look at, it's very hard to combo enough stuff to really make that risk worth it. Against easier villains, it can be fun and it can maybe be worth it. But at the same time, you probably would have done just fine without that. So from a serious mechanical, you know, nerdy perspective, not great. I don't know. I like them. I do think sometimes they can be very useful. You know, I've had Panda Paul take indirect damage that might have, you know, defeated another character instead. So that has been useful having that four health, but no consequential damage. But it is kind of risky. Hazard icons, very, very bad. Now, the other downside here is the rest of the kind of uh, second shadow of the past set, the Dreadpool set that comes with a crisis of infinite Deadpools. There are three cards in that set of seven cards, six of which will then, you know, rotate around. Um, that are really, really bad for your allies. So there are two copies of Poolized, which basically make your highest cost ally turn to the enemies, you know, become a minion, which is really bad when they're so expensive. You know, some of these pool ones that are on the higher side and very risky to begin with. So you're playing a risky, expensive ally that can just get ripped away from you. So if you have had Crisis of Infinite Deadpools come up, then maybe playing your expensive pool allies is a little bit lower priority. The other card is Metacidal Tendencies, which will just, you know, slam two damage out to all your uh, Deadpool allies. So Negasonic Teenage Warhead does dodge this, which is nice, but everyone else is in for a world of suffering, which can be a bit of a problem. So yeah, a little bit tricky there. The sort of second shadow of the past set does not like your allies whatsoever. Next, we need to talk about the side scheme called Live Dangerously. I would say Live Cautiously, but it's a very, very fun card. This is one of those cards that you want to time at the right time to get full effect. But I do want to talk about this in solo compared to multiplayer. In solo play, if you play this for zero cost, what happens is in the next kind of, uh, at the end of the phase, you'll get to draw up to the bigger hand size, which is very nice. You get plus two cards. But during the negative sort of encounter phase, you must suffer all those negative icons on your own. Having all those icons out for too long is bad news. This is a card I generally want to play when I'm about to end the game, one or two turns before that. You know, so maybe I will win on the turn I play it, combo off those icons. Maybe I'll win the turn after I play it, comboing off those icons for two turns. But if it's on for a third or fourth turn, something has probably gone very wrong. You might want to try and clear it. You might want to try and back out. You might just want to really push for that victory if you've somehow not lost the game. Because, yeah, this is pretty tough in solo. Now, in multiplayer, things get much better. In the most extreme example with four players, if you play this card, then at the end of the phase, everyone's going to drop to their new bigger hand size. That's a total of eight plus cards, even if you've still only played zero cost to put this in play. It's the only player side scheme that all its benefits are there immediately and you don't have to clear that higher threat count for it to happen. So that's really nice. And then you've got three extra people with you to deal with all those negative icons. Amplify is worse in multiplayer, but all the other ones are much easier to deal with in multiplayer. You know, it's much easier for four people to take on five encounter cards than one person to take on two. It's just a much better ratio, much better, you know, amount of people to handle that kind of thing. So in multiplayer, this can be a really strong option no matter who you're paired with. If you're paired with other pool players who can all combo off the uh, extra icons here, super, super valuable. There are some fun combos with it. We've got plot convenience. You can play plot convenience, attach Mulligan to it. Then on the next turn, maybe, or, you know, a couple of turns later, play live dangerously. 
then somebody else can take the action on plot convenience to draw mulligan and immediately that turn before the end of the phase drop to that bigger hand size already you've also got cards like ticket to the multiverse and ghost spider which can also benefit in a similar way so i think that's fun and worth mentioning now we've also got i got this this is maybe the centerpiece of the entire kind of danger pool kind of archetype and i really love it i love the art i love the theme i love what it does i do wish it was slightly stronger and this is kind of the crux of the matter when I say I think maybe Danger Pool is the weaker of the archetypes in Pool. Just because I think this card takes more risks to pay off in a good way than I think maybe the designers maybe anticipated. At least that's my experience. So it's a one cost card that does various different things depending on if certain icons are in play. If there's a crisis icon, it will deal three damage. If there's an acceleration icon, it will deal two threat removal. If there's a boost uh, amplify icon, it will ready an ally. If there's a hazard icon, it will draw a card. You can have just one of those icons out and it will deal one of those things. If you have multiple out, it will deal, you know, one effect each, but it doesn't stack. If you have two crisis icons, it will not deal six damage. It will only ever deal three damage. It just counts the first one of each type. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, this card is very playable with just one icon out. You know, if I have a crisis icon out and I'm paying a one cost card to deal three damage, I am happy with that. It's very similar to Clobber in Aggression, which is a card I'm very fond of. I think it is quite popular, but also still kind of underrated. So yeah, getting free damage out of this card is good. But the problem is because you put that negative crisis icon in play, that's a pretty risky thing to do. I think you kind of want more payoff than, you know, you'd otherwise get in a kind of a safer way to achieve this. So I don't really think getting the benefit of one of these negative icons makes this card worth it. Now, if I only have one icon out, yeah, I'll play it, but that's not what I'm aiming for. That's not what I'm building around. That's not going to be a great strategy overall. Two icons out, I think it can be pretty decent, but again, with Amplify, you're going to need the right kind of ally you control to ready. So in multiplayer, you can't ready someone else's ally. In solo play, you know, you've got all those sort of uh, Dreadpool, uh, Quest of Infinite Deadpool, kind of uh, extra Shadow of the Past cards that are hurting your allies. So it's not always clear cut. And some of those allies only have, you know, like one attack, one forwarding. So you're not always going to get a lot of stuff out of the readying on an ally here. Drawing a card is really good. But again, for a hazard icon, it's not very good. The acceleration icon, uh, getting two threat removal is very nice as well. But again, you know, if you've got multiple icons out because you're trying to combo off these things, you might not be able to remove the threat off the main scheme because you've got a crisis icon out. I really sort of kind of wish this card bypassed Crisis as well. I think that'd be a big boost to it and the entire kind of archetype, but still very, very fun. If you do have a lot of icons out, if you maybe play Live Dangerously or have two or three allies on the board, this card is very, very nice. Next up, we have the other events which run off the icons. A very mixed bag here. The Bomb is a card I absolutely love in terms of theme and fun. In terms of actual competitiveness, you know, being really serious about it, it's a lot of money for not honestly a huge amount of damage. The strength of this card is that it's just one card that can lead to a lot of damage. You know, if you draw this in your hand, you're like, okay, if I need a lot of damage, I can just go for this and maybe push for the win. So it's not efficient, but it's one card giving you access to a lot of damage, which is kind of a strength. Now, in multiplayer, it can hurt other heroes, and the villains have a lot of health, so it's less impactful. So I do tend to play this solo more. Maybe on the richer heroes, Captain Marvel that we looked at before is also maybe a good place to maybe put this. But she also has other ways to deal with burst damage as well, so whether you really need that is debatable. Um, but it is really, really fun. I also love the art. It's kind of the cover art for the whole pack. I've used it in the background, as you might see in the video. So a huge fan of that. And if you're enjoying the video and like to see more like this, why not go ahead and drop the bomb on the subscribe button to find more like this, and it really, really helps the channel. We then have Portal Inspection, which is kind of the threat removal kind of counterpart to the bomb. And this is a good part for me to mention two really key things about the Portal aspect. So the bomb does not have the attack kind of trait or kind of clause, even though it is a damage card. There's only one attack card in the entire aspect of Portal that is cut upper that we already looked at, which is a max one of. So if you're playing a character like Miss Marvel, Gamora, Wolverine, even Shadowcat, there's not a lot of attacks to go around, which can be a little bit of a negative. You might even start to look at basic attacks like hit and run to try and, you know, get some use out of those mechanics that bounce of attacks. So that is a little bit risky, um, a little bit unfortunate for those characters that like attacks, but it is what it is. There's only one forwarding card in the entire aspect. Now, allies can fort, and, you know, we just looked at I got this, which can remove threat. There's only one card with the forwarding trait. That's, you know, an event, and that is Paul Inspection, which is very, very expensive, just like the bomb but I think it is better than the bomb. Now in solo play, this is kind of a desperation move. It is kind of a case that, you know, the pool aspect has very, very little threat removal, very little way of its, on its own to deal with uh, threat on the main scheme if you have a crisis icon up, 
Pool Inspection does that, and it can also hit side schemes and things, which can help uh, a lot. So it does have use in solo play, kind of in a desperation sense, in my opinion. I generally don't think it's something you're ever trying to kind of build around as a main part of your game plan. It's kind of just there if you desperately need it. In multiplayer, that changes. There are a lot more players, which means a lot more encounter cards, which means a lot more side schemes, which means a lot more negative icons to power this up. There are a lot more players to bring player side schemes, which is obviously a huge kind of way to make this card more consistent. And the more icons you have out, the more threat it's removing. So you can drop this card, take five threat off the main scheme, and then you can blast a bunch of the side schemes all at once. So in that respect, this card can really pay off in a very nice way. But keep in mind that it is very expensive, so you might need some of those triple pool resources to pull this off. It's something that you might not be able to do all the time. And yeah, a little bit clunky. So these two expensive cards here, I'm not including too often, but they are fun when I can include them. Barely a Scratch is unfortunately kind of suffering from the same problem as I got this. And that is kind of a shame. So it's a zero cost card, but until you have negative icons out, it doesn't do anything. Now, if you have one negative icon out, it can prevent one damage from an attack. It is a defense card. And you can actually have three copies of this, which is nice. This is kind of better than the situation uh, attacking characters or forwarding characters, you know, kind of find themselves in. Defense characters like Shadow Cat and Ghost Spider can include three of these, and it is very good for them. But yeah, one negative icon means one damage prevented. So for a zero cost card, using it defensively, I would kind of expect two damage prevented. A bit like how I compared one resource generation from Heady Carrier being kind of similar in value to the two healing from Healing Factor. Again, I think Healing Factor is slightly more valuable, but you know, it's it's kind of in the same thing. It's closer to the same value than, you know, a resource different. And again, it's the same with damage prevention, kind of being similar to healing, keeping you with that one or two health healthier. If I'm playing a one effective resource card, I want two damage prevented, which means I need two negative icons out. So now I need to have risked two negative icons on the board for this card to basically break even on what I expect in value, what I'm really aiming for, for some competitive, you know, strong decks. So that is kind of unfortunate because that is quite a big ask to have two icons out when you are being attacked because you, you can't even use this card against treacheries or anything. It can only reduce damage from attacks, which limits its scope. And if one of those icons you've introduced is an amplify, then you're preventing a damage, sure, but you've also added a damage on that's probably coming in towards you. So that's not so good. But then you've also got the hazard icon, which could have just caused a whole new attack in the first place. So great, that hazard icon is now helping you prevent one extra damage, but you've introduced a whole extra attack against you with a lot more than one damage. So I kind of want three icons out if I'm going to be using this, you know, on a character that isn't Ghost Spider or Shadow Cat for the most part. But I don't really know if it's worth the setup and then all that deck space when I could have just brought a cheap basic ally to block the attack in most scenarios. So a little bit unfortunate there. So I kind of wish this card was maybe a little bit better baseline and then had a bonus based on the kind of uh, the negative icons. But it is what it is. Some characters do still really like this. And I will say if you're going full on crazy, full on danger and you're having those negative icons out anyway, you might just want this to survive. It will sort of supply something that is suddenly in demand you want to not lose the game. So usable, but slightly unfortunate and not something that's very competitive for deck space in my opinion. The next concept I want to talk about is a little bit kind of more meta and overall. How do you get these negative icons out to combo off in the best way? I see some decks really go all in on the allies. Some decks really just take the side scheme and, you know, set things up for when the side scheme is in, then they're going to get the payoff. I would say the best kind of approach is maybe to take both and it would vary on the deck. Some decks I only take allies and not the side scheme. A couple of decks maybe I'll only take the side scheme, but not really for danger pool, maybe more for the Jedi pool that we'll look at in the future. Because if you only run it lying on the side scheme, then all your events and things that run off the negative icons are offline until that side scheme is in. But that side scheme is so extreme that if you're not in the right situation, you'll probably lose before you manage to win off of it. So yeah, a little bit risky. You do need to be careful there. Um, but allies, you know, building those up steadily and then, you know, playing with dangerously on top of it, that can be really good. And again, one acceleration, one amplify, I think is a very nice balance in most cases, definitely for solo play. Be careful of amplifiers in multiplayer. So the character I've picked for the example here is Shadow Cat. Despite there not being many attacks for her, she is basically custom designed for danger poor otherwise. So being phased lets her bypass crisis icons, but if she defends while phased, which barely a scratch helps her defend without even exhausting while phased, she doesn't take any damage from the attack. So amplify icons that are going to be hurting her actually won't be hurting her so badly at all. So I think this is very strong. There are actually some cards uh, that we haven't looked at that introduce crisis icons as well. She can run those pretty well, um, although one of them I wouldn't recommend as solo. We'll come to that, but you can add those in as we look into them in the next section. But yeah, Shadow Cat, very, very solid. Probably I would say the best danger pool character, but other characters like Angel and Hawkeye also have fun kind of forwarding cards that bypass crisis. 
So there are other options out there for this. Then we have Jedi Pool, which I am so, so excited to talk about. I really like this one. It's going to use a lot of those negative icons that we looked at in the previous section, but it's going to use them in what I would say is a better way. You can take risks with Jedi Pool, which will be much more rewarding than Danger Pool. We'll be able to pull off in most cases, although Jedi Pool is particularly suited to characters with readies. It even likes characters with high attack is that even more and it will need some physical resources for maximum value. So that's pretty easily found, especially thanks to the pool allies that we will want to include because laser swords like negative icons that come with those allies. So laser swords is the main card. We're going to look at that in just a second in full detail. Stick to itiveness, which we've already talked about, helps you ready up. It's all about readying up with that huge attack stat, which will come from these laser swords. So let's get into it. So Laser Swords is a free cost upgrade, which counts as two restricted cards, which is very interesting design space. It makes it very difficult for characters like Venom and maybe uh, Psylocke to take, but most characters don't care about restricted slots anyway, especially not in pool. So Laser Swords can be very good for a lot of characters there. Your hero gets plus one attack for each negative icon in play to a maximum of plus four attack. This is absurdly good. If there's just like an encounter card on the board, maybe the villain started with a side scheme with an amplify icon or something, you know, you're getting plus one just for that. If you start to set up a couple of allies on top of it, very easy to get to two or three plus attack. And if your character already has readies, you know, maybe it's Captain America, Quicksilver, you're starting to get huge amounts of damage off this card. Really, really powerful. And of course, we've got stick to itiveness, which I just talked about and talked about before. Getting that ready consistently, you know, on the board that you can just trigger every turn with laser sword, the damage stacks up very, very quickly. Now, the downside here is, Laser Swords on its own, if there are no negative icons out, it doesn't do anything. So it can be a very expensive card for effective resources. You know, you've got five cards in your hand, maybe. You choose Laser Swords to play. You pay your four res uh, free resources. And, you know, it's it's not really done anything yet if there's no negative icons. And it might even take a couple of turns to fully pay off that value anyway. But the high-end potential of this is absurd. It can do some crazy damage, especially for ending games. It will just carve through minions if you're kind of ready to ready up and have good attack stats with it. So in multiplayer, it shines a little bit more because, you know, other people can cover for you while you set up. Other people can deal with threat while you're investing into these big damage options. And then you can just kind of take care of everything. But I still think this is good in solo play. You just have to be a little bit more careful about it. And I would even go as far to say, sometimes even if I built entirely around this card, and it is a max one per deck, so you only have one chance kind of to play it per deck cycle, I will sometimes not play it if the situation would put me in kind of maybe a losing position. But most of the time, it's worth going out of your way for it because it's so good. Oh, and I should shout out that in multiplayer, an aggression character or cable can bring a lock and load, which is a aggression side scheme that lets you bring in a weapon. Very, very good for this. Cable could also bring live dangerously for you to play those negative icons at the right time to give you a massive damage boost. So I've sort of alluded to this already, but you can use the villain's own negative icons they put out into the board to benefit yourself. So let's say your second Shadow of the Past comes out, you've got this Dreadful Deed side scheme, which we didn't really talk about before, but it's pretty mild. It's just one negative icon for threat in most cases. It will just sit there and I will sometimes leave it there. If I'm playing Jedi Pool or Danger Pool, I will just say, hey, an Amplify icon, now I'm going to get extra benefits from that. And some cases I will defeat it, especially in multiplayer maybe, but you know, it's kind of a balancing act. You can kind of evaluate that as you go. And yeah, just having negative icons from the villain's kind of actions can really benefit you. We can take Claw as a good example of this too. In his setup, in expert mode, he will start with a crisis and an acceleration token on the board. I could play laser swords turn one, use those big attack stats to take up the minion, which he also starts with in play against you. And, you know, you've really benefited from what the villain has tried to have hurt you already at that point. So that kind of thing is very fun. I think the um, Mutant Genesis scenario at Project Wide Awake also starts with a lot of size games in play, a lot of icons. So size, uh, situations like that, you can get some extra benefit, an extra head start with kind of these more risky uh, archetypes as well. So use the villain's tools against them. If there's a good icon for you that's not too difficult to deal with, maybe just leave that side scheme on the board. No big deal. So then we have Vivian, and Vivian can interact with those side schemes in a very interesting way. She's a basic ally, but she's very good for the risky archetypes because she can blank those negative icons. The way she works is she can, uh, after she enters play, you get to choose an attachment, non-elite minion, or a side scheme, and you blank all the text on it, which is really very good, except traits. And what this means for us in the pool aspect is because icons and these negative icons count as text on the card, we can blank them out. So I could do something like play Live Dangerously, have all these negative icons appear, get suddenly plus four damage from laser swords, go crazy attacking with it. Then I play Vivian and I blank Live Dangerously and I don't have any of those negative icons taking effect for the whole villain round. Then at the start of my next turn, the effect wears off. 
So I've got all this negative icons back again, and I've got another turn with laser swords massive damage. That kind of thing is very powerful. You can also use it for the villain's normal uh, side humans they might be putting out. So that's very useful. You will lose the plus two hand size from Live Dangerously if you blank the text, but I would say in solo play that is generally always worth it. Maybe not so much in multiplayer, but it's an interesting balancing act. If you just need a reprieve for one turn, you know, if maybe there's a crisis icon side scheme out that you've left out to benefit from, but all threats kind of dicey, let's play Vivian, blank it, get the threat down, then next turn we can benefit from it again as well. Things like that can be really good for the dangerous kind of pool archetypes. Now, we have a few other cards in the kind of sort of risky kind of pool side, which I haven't talked about. And since this is the final kind of archetype we're talking about, we're going to talk about them here just to finish off all the cards. We have War, which is a one cost upgrade, which I absolutely love. It's another meta game. This one is not that powerful. It is probably the weakest meta game in my opinion, but it is very fun still. And this is a card which you exhaust it. And a bit like Rock, Paper, Scissors, you have multiple things going on from multiple card sort of sources. So what you do is you discard a card from the encounter deck, then you discard a card from your deck. You count the cards from the encounter card and you take damage equal to the uh, boost and star icons on that. So you can take a hefty amount of damage or not very much at all. The harder the villain is, the more boost icons and things they have in general, the worse this will tend to be. And then you count the kind of resource cost on your card, not the resources, but the cost, and you deal that much damage to an enemy. So if you discard a zero boost icon card from the villain's deck, and then you discard a four cost card from your deck, you'll just get four damage basically for free, which is excellent. The downside is you could get a free boost card from the villain deck and discard like a one cost card or something from your deck, which means you're taking free damage the villain is taking one. That is a very bad trade. In general, equal trades are quite bad here in general because the villain will have a lot more health than you will, especially if you include like minions. You know, the amount of damage you need to do combined to minions and the villain throughout the game is much, much more than they need to do to you. So it takes careful use. This card likes characters with high costs. It does like it if you're building for those, you know, pool resources, putting in more free cost cards. That will increase your chances of a good result from war. Characters that can swap cards around on top of their deck can be very nice as well. And characters with an excess of health like Hulk can be good with this. He's got these expensive cards too. So War has some places where it can be decent, but it is quite risky. And I generally don't take that risk, but I really enjoy it when I do use it. Bazooka is kind of uh, okay. It's a two cost card, which has one use when it deals damage equal to the negative icons out on the board. Now, if you set up a massive amount of icons, it can be really good. And since you can kind of play it, it will sit there until you use it. It can kind of be good for burst damage when you need it. But I would say it takes a lot of negative icons to get value from this uh, that I would want. So yeah, a little bit slow, only one use. The keyword doesn't really matter that much. I think it has some situational use in multiplayer when you're getting lots of negative icons out. But generally, because it's restricted as well, it doesn't work with the laser swords. And I think those are generally better. But if you're playing kind of more of the danger pool type without the laser swords, it can be okay to finish off the villain, especially in combination with tic-tac-toe. Then we have Deadpool ship which is again, very, very fun, but I'm not in love with this card. There's a reason it hasn't come up yet. I don't think it's great to build strategies around this card. You have to pay one cost, basically in order to get Star Wars hero power that only works on pool allies. It's an action, you exhaust it, you get an encounter card in front of you, and then you get to put a pool ally into play. Now, unfortunately, most of the expensive allies are maybe a little risky. And then you've got the two and three cost ones and you know Lady Deadpool, which are pretty good, but you're taking a risk getting the encounter card to put in a risky uh, you know, ally with a negative icon. And you've had to pay for the privilege to do that. So for me, I actually don't find this card pays off in most circumstances. Definitely better in multiplayer where it's easier to absorb that encounter card. But again, not something I'm in love with. With the triple resources already in pool, I generally, if I really want to play one of those allies, I will maybe have some other way to do that. I have good economy already. So use with caution. Star Lord does have special synergy with it, but even then he can like, you know, use his hero ability already. Is he really going to want to have, you know, two encounter cards on a turn where he's starting to set up poor allies, which again, they're not a rush allies at all, which is kind of what he would want to take a lot of encounter cards to do is to rush. So a little bit tricky in that regard. I do think it's good on him though, but yeah, use with caution, use for fun. But these cards here, I generally don't think are pushing all your most competitive decks, unless you're using Bazooka to try and set up that one turn kill in specific situations. Then we have the crisis cards, which I alluded to earlier with Shadowcat. I do like Ambush a lot. Distraction, I think, is kind of kind of anti-synergistic with itself. Um, it's a zero cost upgrade that you put on a minion. That minion cannot activate. That's really good. That's basically like pinned down and it works on non-elite minions. But then that minion is basically, you know, irrelevant for the rest of the game. The problem is the crisis icon is there. 
And if you're trying to deactivate a minion for you know several turns, that is kind of a long-term strategy, but like putting a crisis icon onto the board is kind of a short-term strategy. This can be good to kind of hold a minion if you cannot deal with it immediately. If your character kind of has, you know, uh, attacks that hit the whole board at once, you might want to kind of stack up a couple minions just to strengthen them, then hit them all at once. That can be very efficient. But in general, I think this card wants to help you in the long term, but will hurt you on the fret in the short term. So a little bit tricky to make work. Ambush, however, I love this card. One cost upgrade in solo play. Okay, admittedly, not that good. If you're a solo player, I'm generally not going to recommend you take Ambush. But in multiplayer, I absolutely am, especially three and four player, especially if you're bringing player side schemes. So this upgrade is something you attach to a side scheme. So you need a side scheme out to make it usable. That's kind of the first hoop you need to jump through. The second hoop you need to jump through is you need a minion out because this actually defeats a non-elite minion or rather it discards it. So it defeats when defeated effects, which is very, very nice. So if you have a side scheme out and you're gonna defeat it anyway, and there's a minion out that you want defeated, just play ambush. And for that one cost, you're defeating the side scheme and getting the bonus of taking out the minion. This is very strong, especially against some of these stronger sort of non-elite minions. We've got like Acolytes with Magneto and Magneto has plenty of side schemes. So these things kind of work really well together. Player side schemes make it very consistent. Cards like uh, Plot Convenience that you can store this under also make it very convenient. And I really, really like this. Now, just stepping outside of pool very briefly, we have what I'm calling the honorary pool cards. They are basic, but they fit into the pool aspect very well. We talked a little bit about Deadpool earlier, how his wild resource is really good for rock, paper, scissors. But because of pool's low threat removal, his two forwarding that's quite repeatable is also very nice. And you know, look guys, it's the pool aspect. He's Deadpool. It just makes sense. Then we've got the Symbiote Suit and Venom ally who have the hazard icon. And obviously we're wanting to combo with you know, negative icons in uh, both the Jedi pool aspect we're talking about now and the previous one, the sort of danger pool archetype. So they can be really good there. Now, unfortunately, I do think allies with hazard icons take so much work to make worth it that they're generally just not worth it. But I do think Venom is slightly better than Panda Paul and Negasonic Teenage Warhead because thanks to his response, you can actually burn through his health quite quickly. So you can get quite a bit of value out and then you have to really suffer from one encounter card a lot of the time. And I do think that is good. Now, Symbiote Suit, I really like, but only for certain pool decks still. But still, if you're playing Jedi Pool with stick to itiveness, maybe you've got some other readies on your character, you're going to get a lot of value from that plus one uh, to all the stats. But then the Hazard Icon is giving you plus one from the Laser Swords. Plus one hand size is just very nice in general and can help with Mulligan. And then, you know, plus 10 hit points. You know, if you're playing a risky kind of uh, archetype, then that's just going to help you not lose the game. So actually, Symbiote Suit can be really good. I still don't use it in a lot of pool decks, but I'm always thinking about it if I've got laser swords and, you know, the triple resources, which again, I will kind of always have. Then we're going to go outside the pool aspect even more over to Justice. You guys have heard me say it, the pool aspect and threat removal, not the best of friends. Justice loves threat removal. Bring a Justice player and multiplayer, have fun. Crisis Averted actually bypasses the Crisis Icon, which makes it a really good combo. This card comes in Scarlet Witch's pack, very, very nice. But you can also do things with one way or another, which comes in a couple of people's packs. I think it's in Nebulas. I think it's in Spider Hams. And this card lets you search the encounter card for a side scheme. So let's say your pool player has laser swords on the board, or I got this in hand, and they want some extra you know, damage boost or specific effect from the card. The justice player can play one way or another. They can pick out a side scheme with the right icon, put that into play, draw the cards from one way or another still, and now the pool player can benefit from those icons. So that's a fun little combo you can do in multiplayer. So I've gone for X23 for the example here. She has so many ready ups, really good attack stat. You know, it just makes so much sense. She does typically like cheaper cards, but because her, you know, base kit, her basic abilities are so good, you can kind of hold down the game with those while you play a couple of setup cards as well and then get tons and tons of work because she can win so quickly without needing to set up in solo play. Again, this is, again, a bit better in multiplayer, which is kind of a theme for the pool aspect and for Jedi pool, but it can work really well in solo as well. There's a lot of good synergy here. Tic-Tac-Toe will help keep Honey Badger alive, which will keep you readying. Get Ragey can keep Honey Badger doing lots of damage. X-Force Recruit to get her up a little bit in health so you can get ragey and heal her more flexibly. So a lot of good stuff going on there. Just very, very solid. She does like physical resources, but thankfully the pool aspect doesn't, which is a very nice benefit. You know, it can be hard to run what doesn't kill me in protection because that wants a physical resource and protection doesn't provide a lot of good ones to her, but the pool aspect will. And we have put in some enhanced physique here just to make that even more consistent. So yeah, I really like X-23 with the kind of Jedi pool archetype. And that brings us really to the end of the main archetype section, but there is a little bit more to talk about. If you want to go ahead and build your own kind of deck in these archetypes, I've got some ideas for different heroes, which are good in each of these uh, archetypes respectively. Hopefully you can figure out kind of how they work. You want readies in Jedi pool. Danger pool wants ways to either mitigate the icons or just go kind of crazy with them. 
And then you've got save pool, which kind of just benefits from card cycling and, you know, maybe wild resources if you rock, paper, scissors, things like that. But there's some really, really good options. I would say every hero in the game has a good way to be built in the pool aspect. Probably not their strongest build by any means if you looked at all the aspects, but definitely, you know, pretty viable, especially in multiplayer. But I want to talk about how to sort of do hybrid builds as well, because a lot of these key cards we've been talking about only kind of consist of one or two cards. You can absolutely bring lightsabers, uh, laser swords, and I, I got this, you know, from Danger Pool and combine them. You can take both the kind of risky approaches and try and benefit from your icons in two different ways. And that can honestly be one of the better ways to do it. You can also lean really heavily into kind of the safe cards and still bring something dangerous. You know, I can build a completely safe deck, but just have the uh, player side scheme live dangerously and laser swords. And I can maybe put out a massive, you know, high attack combo near the end of the game from that. So you can mix it up. And I want to refer back to an image we looked to at the very start of the video, which is how to kind of, you know, form decks from the uh, aspect. Careful cards, the safe pool cards really form the foundation. If you add on basic cards, you get up to safe pool. And on the risky cards, you can kind of build more to a Jedi pool or danger pool. But you could just add a little bit from each of these and you can kind of build that hybrid approach. It's very, very easy to do. And some characters it's really very good with. Now there's been a lot of information here. This has been a very long video, the longest video I've ever done on my channel. So if you can't remember all the kind of key points, you can always refer back. There's chapters at the bottom, but in case you can't, in case you want something a little bit easier, I've got this deck building cheat sheet right here. Now this is just a starting point and I should say all the information I say throughout this video, you know, it's really just my opinion. It's a starting point. It's from what my experience has kind of uh, taught me but you should make your own decisions, use your own judgment as you go and experience more of the aspect. And there are exceptions to everything. What I'm saying here is very general advice. Now, this sheet here in particular, if you follow it to the letter, if you go through it section by section, you'll basically end up with a safe pool deck that could maybe, you know, be tweaked and become a danger or Jedi pool deck as well. But in general, it would set you up for a pretty generic but solid kind of way to play the pool aspect. Now, one of the last points I want to make is just about multiplayer again. I've said it before, but really I cannot stress it enough. The pool aspect is so much better in multiplayer. Having a justice deck or, you know, just a strong threat removal character with you just really lets this kind of aspect breathe and do what it wants to do without the threat of threat threatening them. And if you are playing it in multiplayer, I would compare it to the aggression role because it tends to lean into damage a bit more than threat removal. But because it does amplify your hero and make your hero do more of what your hero does, if your hero is very good at threat removal, you can kind of have pool kind of decks be more like an all-rounder kind of leadershipy deck instead. But generally, you're going to be a bit more damage focused. The other thing I really want to say is, and I did allude to it briefly, multiple pool characters in multiplayer is also super good. Now, you might still want a justice character with them in three or four player, you know, leadership with lots of forwarding. But really, if you can play one negative icon, but multiple people benefit from it all at once, that is super good. Now, there's a catch there that if you normally play from one collection, but play multiplayer, you're going to need to buy two packs of Deadpool, which is something I have done. And I think it has been worth it but it is kind of going against the philosophy that this game kind of, you know, promised that you only need to buy one of each pack. So it's a little bit iffy in that regard, but if you have friends who have their own copy of Deadpool and you want to bring all the pool stuff together and, you know, have a great time there, then yeah, this is going to be really fun. I definitely highly recommend it. You know, there's nothing more satisfying than having multiple people on the board or with double lightsabers or doing stupid amounts of damage at once. It's very, very good. Now, aside from those benefits, I also think most of the cards in the pool aspect really benefit more from being in multiplayer than solo. There are still some that are quite neutral and even maybe one or two that are better in solo. But for the most part, all these cards are cards I think are better in multiplayer because, you know, you've got more room to breathe with the icons. You've got more kind of opportunities to use the more niche kind of more, you know, things that have hoops to jump through, things that are conditional on certain things being true will be more likely to be true in multiplayer. And that about does it. So in summary, Mulligan, very good. I normally take one, often three of these in every pool deck. Triple resources, so hard not to take. Your damage in pool will generally be good, but your forwarding would be a little bit low. You'll be really good at amplifying what your hero already does, but not introducing too much new to what they do. So do be careful in solo play. If you're playing solo, if you're just starting out, definitely try and take a strong solo character. Again, I know that's sort of non-advice, strong solo character for solo. It's obvious, but pool is really kind of going to emphasize that, especially compared to most aspects. And again, it is often called high risk. I don't think it really should be high risk. I think you want to go for smart risk. Smart risks pay off. High risks generally don't pay off. So play pool with just that pinch of caution if you're really trying to get some good results. And again, multiplayer, justice is its friend. Be careful with amplifiers in multiplayer. Be careful with accelerations in solo. 
That's my overall advice. I hope this has helped you guys. I've really, really enjoyed making this. If you've enjoyed it, please consider subscribing. Again, it helps the channel, but it also should help you guys find more videos like this. I do a lot of very nerdy analytical stuff on Marvel Champions, and I'm really excited about where the channel is going. And yep, that's about it. Have a great day, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye.